Hi, I'm Dan Crane. I'm a professor in the biology department at Wright State University in Dayton, Ohio. And uh, I'm going to talk with you this, uh, during the course of this video about an emerging area called probabilistic genotyping. Uh, essentially the use of uh, sophisticated computer algorithms to help us attach statistical weights to some of the most challenging of forensic DNA profiling samples. Uh, like all the other videos in this series, uh, the PowerPoint presentation that you'll be seeing on and off during the course of this video is available at uh, bioforensics.com as well as other materials uh, such as the articles that I'll be referencing and uh, transcripts from trials where these issues have been discussed. <clears throat> so again, if you'd like more information about any of these topics, uh, bioforensics.com would probably be a good place for you to take a look. All right, well with that said, let's get right to the topic at hand here. And I've, uh, I'm showing to you now a pair of DNA profilings, uh, a pair of DNA profiles that I think everyone would agree uh, represent what very challenging forensic DNA profiles look like, very challenging from the perspective of interpreting these test results. Uh, there are questions, I think, as to whether or not we even have peaks at some of the loci for which we're seeing some information. Uh, and something that's perhaps uh, particularly interesting about this pair of profiles is they actually come from the very same evidence sample. A single swab was taken from a low copy number DNA sample and a DNA profile was generated from that single sample. It was generated two separate times and these are the results that we see uh, between the first and the second time that sample gave rise to a DNA profile. And so the question I ask on the slide is do the profiles match? Well I can tell you we know that they should. They actually came from the same evidence sample and yet if you look between them, you can see some pretty significant differences. Differences in the numbers of peaks between one run at a locus and the next run at the locus. Differences in the heights of the peaks. Uh, differences in the levels of baseline noise. And so for this particular pair of electropherograms, I think a reasonable question is, do they match? Uh, and it really does illustrate that sometimes the interpretation of DNA test results can be very challenging and very difficult. The question then becomes, why is this an issue? Uh, and it is increasingly an issue, it's fair to say as well. The reason it's an issue is because crime laboratories are increasingly under pressure to generate DNA test results from, in, from more and more marginal samples. Uh, samples that as little as five or ten years ago a lab would have simply said there's not enough material for us to work with, uh, we're not even going to attempt to generate a DNA profile. Today uh, they are now saying well we'll, we'll do what we can uh, using more sensitive methodologies and see if we can't give rise to some uh, useful results that will help us understand better what happened at this particular crime scene. So again increasingly crime laboratories are using more challenging evidence samples. Uh, we're seeing test results increasingly from things like the grips of guns or the trigger of a gun, the steering wheel of a car, doorknobs and, and things of that nature. And what we see then is when DNA profiles get generated from those very marginal samples where there's small amounts of template DNA available to generate the results is increasingly that these samples appear to be mixtures. Uh, it's no longer a single source sample or a two-person mixture, but a very complicated mixture containing DNA from three or more individuals. Uh, the samples are often showing signs of degradation, uh, and it's often very difficult to discern uh, what are the contributions that have been made by minor contributors to the sample as opposed to major contributors to the sample. And in a word, what's happening with these types of tests, with these very small amounts of template DNA, is that they are dominated by stochastic effects. And the problem then comes from this fact. Uh, the test kits that crime laboratories around the world are using are not designed to work well with such low-level samples. That contributes significantly to the problems that we're having. But in addition to that, uh, the statistical approaches that have been widely used within the United States uh, no longer apply to these types of samples. Uh, 
You'll know from other videos in this series that for a single source sample, the random match probability is the preferred statistic within the United States, but the random match probability requires that there be just one contributor to the sample, and further, there's an expectation that the information is relatively complete uh, that we're getting and in inputting into the test results. One of the problems that we're having is that the test kits that crime laboratories are currently using to generate DNA profiles are actually specifically designed to fail when small amounts of template DNA are used as the basis for the tests. So for these marginal samples, the test kits themselves are likely to give rise to problems, incomplete results that will cause subsequent problems with the interpretations of the results. But in addition to that, not only do the test kits pose problems for these marginal samples, the statistical approaches that crime laboratories use to attach a weight to the finding of a DNA profile match also have problems with these low-level samples. You'll know from other videos in this series that there are two commonly used statistical approaches to attach weights to DNA evidence results. Random match probability tests, uh, random match probability statistics are what are used for single source samples. So when we know there's just one contributor to a sample, the random match probability can give us a generally accepted statistical weight to the failure to exclude an individual as a possible contributor. But the random match probability approaches uh, absolutely require that we know that there is just one contributor to the sample. They can handle some problems in terms of how confident we are that all the DNA results have been obtained. In other words, it can be, it, the random match probability statistics can be modified to take into account that allelic dropout and drop in may have occurred but we must know the number of contributors to the sample. An alternative to the random match probability statistic is the combined probability of inclusion. With the combined probability of inclusion, it is no longer necessary to have knowledge of the number of contributors to the sample, but it is now essential that we know uh, that the results are complete, that all the information that was associated with the evidence sample is in fact represented in the electropherograms. The, ran, uh, the combined probability of inclusion approach cannot tolerate uh, uncertainties about whether or not drop-in or drop-out have occurred. And so again, we find ourselves in a difficult situation with these marginal samples that are increasingly being generated. Uh, if there's uncertainty about the number of contributors, then we find that we need to start thinking about using a combined probability of inclusion approach. If we're uncertain about whether or not the information on the electropherograms is complete, then we can't use the combined probability of inclusion approach, and then we find ourselves wondering how to attach a statistical weight. And so again, at the crux of the problem here are these stochastic effects. And stochastic effects very simply means this, that random factors, things like the phase of the moon, or the, is the calendar date an odd or an even number? Again, completely random factors begin to dominate what we're seeing in the test results that get generated from these marginal samples. Ideally, what we like for any scientific approach is that the, that the data that we're accumulating is governed entirely by the underlying test, by what it is that we're actually testing. But with stochastic effects, we need to start to worry that random things are having an equal say, if not a greater say, in terms of what it is that we see at the end of the process when we're looking at these electropherograms. So let me give you some specific examples of stochastic effects as they manifest themselves in the context of forensic DNA profiling. Uh, many people will tell you that there are four principal or commonly encountered stochastic effects for DNA profiling. Uh, in the center of the screen, right now, you can see an electropherogram for a particular locus that shows what the DNA profile for the sample actually is. There are no stochastic effects in play here. There's a 19 allele and a 25 allele. But let's consider the first of these four possible stochastic effects. 
This one we call peak height imbalance. And it's very aptly named, isn't it? What you can see is that now the height of the 19 allele is much shorter than the height of the 25 allele. We know that there's an equal amount of the 19 allele and the 25 allele in the underlying sample. And we expect then that they should give rise to peaks of the same height. And yet, when we're dealing with small amounts of DNA, peak height imbalance can manifest itself. An extreme example of peak height imbalance constitutes this second kind of stochastic effect, and that is the phenomenon that's known as allelic dropout. Here, not only is there an imbalance in the height of the 19 and the 25, but the 19 has failed to be detected altogether. What had begun as a sample from a heterozygous individual that has two different alleles at this locus, now in this test, appears for all intents and purposes to have come from a homozygote. Somebody has two copies of the 25 allele, and there's again, when dropout has occurred, no indication even that there was another allele there. We've simply failed to detect it. A third kind of stochastic effect that commonly occurs is the reciprocal, in some sense, of dropout, and that is this idea of allelic drop-in. In this electropherogram, you can see the 19 and the 25 have been detected, as we expect that they should, given our knowledge of what the underlying sample contains. But in addition to that, a third allele, here a 21, uh, that wasn't part of the original sample, is also being detected. Many crime laboratories would call an allele like this 21 that has dropped in uh, contamination. And there's no end of possibilities in terms of where that 21 may have come from. It may have come from an analyst. It may have come from some of the reagents or the plastic wear that the testing laboratory has used. But the thing that makes it drop in is it wasn't actually part of the sample that was collected at the crime scene, and yet it's appearing in the electropherogram as if it may well have been. And the fourth commonly encountered stochastic effect is something related to another kind of technical artifact uh, called stutter. Uh, stutter peaks are very commonly observed in forensic DNA test results. They're recognized typically by their position, being one set of tetranucleotide repeats before another peak, and their height. So if you see a small peak immediately preceding a large peak, it's easy to attribute that to this stutter phenomenon, again, a fairly commonly encountered technical artifact in DNA profiling. Together, these four stochastic effects constitute the majority of stochastic effects that show up in forensic DNA profiling contexts. And again, at the heart of it all, they make it difficult for us to interpret just what the original DNA in the sample actually contained. All of these stochastic effects are things that begin to occur, begin to be problematic once we're trying to generate results below what's known as the stochastic threshold. There's a certain level of input DNA, template DNA that's used by the tests, that once you get beneath that level, stochastic effects begin to dominate. There's still some ongoing debate as to what the stochastic threshold actually is, but I think pretty much everybody at this point agrees that once you're below 100 picograms or so of template DNA, we're at risk of experiencing or observing these stochastic effects. At the end of the day, bear in mind that all of these stochastic effects are due ultimately to sampling errors due to the fact that we're reaching into a, uh, a bag of beans and we're pulling out too few beans for us to be able to make a good assessment in terms of what kind of beans are in the bag. Are they all black? Could they be black ones mixed with white ones? Could there be some red beans in there? I think we all appreciate intuitively that when you do that sort of sample, if you get too small of a sample, you may not get a good uh, indication in terms of what's associated with the sample in the first place. And the important thing then to bear in mind when we're talking about sampling error is that it's not really possible for any manipulation or analysis after that sample has been taken to fix the problem that's the root of the, the issue here, and that is we had too small of a sample in the first place. So when we've gotten, when we get test results from marginal samples 
that have been generated from very small amounts of template DNA, you have to bear in mind that it's going to be very difficult to, after the fact now, go back and be able to correct these problems, these stochastic effects that originate ultimately from that, uh, that decision that caused us to get results from too small an amount of template DNA. All right, now I want to give you a, 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 an example here from some real live data that actually shows stochastic effects in play. So what I have here for you is a pair of electropherograms. The one on the top is a set of test results that have been generated using the manufacturer's recommended amounts of template DNA for the tests to give rise to reliable results here. That's one nanogram of template DNA. Um, and the electropherogram below is using a much smaller amount of template DNA. Here just eight picograms. I've mentioned that about 100 picograms or less is when we start to worry about the possibility of stochastic effects. By the time you're at eight picograms, we're talking about the amount of DNA that comes from on the order of a single human cell. This is much below that what we would expect the stochastic threshold to be. So just to cut to the chase, on this upper electropherogram, these are the right results. We should expect that the individual whose DNA gave rise to this DNA profile really is a 9-12 at the D5 locus and an 11-12 at the D13 locus and an 11-11 at the D7 locus. That's the right answer. But look what sort of things happen when we use less than the recommended amounts of template DNA. <clears throat> First thing that you'll notice is that this individual's 12 allele at the D5 locus fails to be detected. You'll know from what we've already talked about in this particular video that there's a word for that. That's called allelic dropout. And again, this is real data. You can say with confidence there is no indication of that 12 allele there. It has simply dropped out. And I'm sure you've already noticed that the flip side of allelic dropout is also in play here, and that is allelic drop-in. In the low copy number test result, we're seeing a 14 allele that shows up, looks like it could be a legitimate signal, and yet we know the right answer didn't have a 14 in it. There's no hint of a 14 there. Again, this is a nice, clean example of this phenomenon known as allelic drop-in. It's not part of the original sample, and yet when we look at these test results, it appears indistinguishable from things that we can be reasonably confident are there. In addition to those two stochastic effects, there's another instance or another example for you here of peak height imbalance. Here the 11 allele and the 12 allele are very different in size, whereas in the original sample they were comparable in size. And again, originally 87% for the peak height ratio between the 11 and the 12 allele down to as little as 50% here for that second locus. And so, how have laboratories dealt with these problems over the years? What do they do to avoid the interpretation problems associated with low levels of DNA? Well, there's a two-part answer. They have rules and they have thresholds. And I'll cut right to the chase here again as well. These rules tend to be things that cannot be uh, avoided. Uh, the testing laboratories uh, follow these rules uh, very faithfully, and the thresholds are also things for which there's little, if any, wiggle room that's allowed. And the thing about these thresholds and the rules that end up being associated with them is that they make interpretation of electropherograms a very binary process. In other words, alleles are either present or absent and there's no gray area. They don't allow in any way for gray area. They don't allow for us to say, well, I'm pretty sure that that's an allele, but I could be persuaded it's not. It's either present or it's absent. These rules and the thresholds associated with them get established early on in a laboratory's history, both by the manufacturer of the test kits that are used, as well as the lab's initial use of the, the test kits within their own hands, sometimes 10, 15 years prior to their work on particular cases. And the rules and thresholds are always carefully documented in a laboratory's interpretation guidelines. 
Uh, every laboratory is expected to make their own set of interpretation guidelines and every laboratory is expected to have rules and thresholds for every testing platform, test kit, and instrument that they use. So here are some examples of what I mean by these thresholds. A very common threshold used by laboratories is what's known as an analytical threshold, uh, also referred to as a detection threshold. In this instance, the analytical threshold is set at 50 RFU, relative fluorescent unit. And very simply, if a peak doesn't rise above that threshold, the laboratory wouldn't bother to pay attention to it. They'd say, in essence, that it is possible that it is noise as opposed to the signal, and again, they would disregard it. If this 19 doesn't rise above that 50 RFU level, uh, it wouldn't even show up in most testing laboratories' reports. In addition to that, testing laboratories will establish another threshold called the stochastic threshold, here we've got it drawn at 200 RFUs. Some laboratories may go as low as 150, others up to five or even 600 RFUs. But what the stochastic threshold is intended to achieve is this is the point at which if we see a peak rise above it, we can be reasonably confident that a sister to this allele, the 25, has not failed to be detected. In other words, if we see just one peak at a locus and it's above the stochastic threshold, the testing laboratory will be confident that what we're looking at here is a single peak that comes from a homozygous individual and that their second peak did not experience dropout. So again, you can see how these two thresholds could end up being helpful in dealing with marginal samples. Another set of thresholds come from peak height ratio considerations, as well as from considerations about the artifact stutter, these two other stochastic thresholds that are commonly encountered uh, with low level samples. So let's talk about peak height ratios. First, you can see the 19 here, this allele, that peak is smaller than the 20. If you wanted to talk about the peak height ratio, it's a simple mathematical exercise. You would take the height of the smaller peak, here the 19, and divide it by the height of the taller peak, here the 25, and you get a peak height ratio. Many testing laboratories would consider that a peak height ratio that is lower than 70, or maybe in some labs instances, 60%, if the peak height ratio goes below those thresholds, they take that as an indication that what we're seeing is likely to be DNA that came from two or more individuals, as opposed to one individual for which there's just a subtle difference between the height of one of their alleles and their other allele at a locus. So the peak height ratios are often used as an indication that a sample is a mixture. Also on the slide, though, is an opportunity to talk a little bit about stutter ratios. Here, we've got a 25 allele, a peak that's quite tall and strong. Immediately preceding it, though, is a smaller peak that's four nucleotides smaller in size. It's one tetranucleotide repeat shorter, so that would be a 24 allele. We recognize stutter by its position as well as its height relative to a primary peak. Here, the 24 is small. It's in the right position, but it's small. And based on the lab's validation studies, if the peak falls below this dotted line, the stutter threshold, the laboratory would disregard it and say that's not signal, it's not something that's associated with alleles that are present in the sample. Instead, it's a technical artifact. The converse, though, is true as well. And that is if a peak rises above that stutter threshold, the laboratory would say, based on their protocols, typically that that means that there were, were actually three alleles detected at this locus, the 19, the 25, and again, if the 24 is above that dotted line, also a 24. Notice that these are binary ratios. I've mentioned that already. If a peak falls below this line, it's disregarded. If it rises above the line, it's given the full uh, confidence that you attach to the observation of an allele in a sample. There is no gray area. If it's right on the line or just above the line or just below the line, it doesn't get treated uh, as a gray sample. We don't say it's likely to be stutter. We simply say it is stutter 
or it is not stutter. Again, testing laboratories attach a great deal of weight to these interpretation guidelines that are derived from their validation studies. They all establish them early in the process of setting up the, the testing laboratory. Uh, the values that are used for the thresholds often differ significantly from one testing laboratory to another, and even within a laboratory from one test kit or from one testing platform to another. And laboratories adhere to these interpretation guidelines very rigidly, and analysts fully expect to be vigorously cross-examined if they make note of departures from what's established during the course of those validation studies and written down then in their interpretation guidelines. In fact, they expect such vigorous cross-examination that uh, they go to great lengths to avoid uh, departing from what it is that their interpretation guidelines instruct them to do. And again, why is this becoming an issue? Why do we need to talk about probabilistic genotyping? Well, I've already mentioned that the commonly used approaches for attaching statistical weights to DNA profiles, the random match probability and the combined probability of inclusion, cannot work when we're talking about samples where there are an unknown number of contributors and where allelic dropout, and I suppose where allelic drop-in, may have occurred. At the end of the process, we need to bear in mind that if it's not possible to attach reliable statistical weight to the failure to exclude an individual as a contributor to a DNA profile, if it's not possible to attach a weight to that observation, the standard practice within the United States is to not allow any mention to be made of the DNA test results. Quite simply, in those circumstances, if we have questions about the number of contributors and or whether or not allelic dropout may have occurred, crime laboratories, interpretation guidelines say that they should report those tests results as being inconclusive. We're no better position to determine if an individual contributed to the evidence sample after the test was performed than we were before the tests were conducted. Once again, there is no generally accepted means for attaching a statistical weight to a mixed sample with an unknown number of contributors where dropout may have occurred. If you don't have a statistic, at least within the United States, that translates very directly on the basis of a large amount of existing case law to the DNA tests not being admissible as evidence uh, to be heard by a jury. And so that causes some problems. You can imagine that a DNA test result doesn't tell us an un unambiguously the number of contributors and doesn't tell us with confidence that dropout may have occurred or has not occurred. And what ends up happening is crime laboratories will look at these results and they'll say, gee, they look like there could be something important happening here, but I can't attach a statistical weight. And it's unsettling in those circumstances to simply walk away and say the tests were inconclusive. And what's happening is there is an opportunity now for some alternative to the existing and commonly used statistics to provide an answer to those problems. And quite simply, that's why we're talking right now about probabilistic genotyping. Probabilistic genotyping provides a, a potential solution to that particular problem. At the heart of probabilistic genotyping is this approach known as likelihood ratios. With likelihood ratios, we're simply comparing the relative likelihood of two explanations for what we see within an evidence sample. Those alternative explanations are commonly simply referred to as, as a prosecution hypothesis or as a defense hypothesis. And what makes likelihood ratio approaches appealing in this context is that they lend themselves better to continuous types of data, not binary data, is the peak present or absent, but rather with continuous data, we're talking about the possibility that, gee, I'm 90% sure that this is a peak, but there's a 10% chance that this is actually noise, or a 10% chance that this is an artifact like stutter. And so likelihood ratios, again, can, are better suited to capturing those sorts of nuances in the data.
Now, interestingly, likelihood ratios have been the method of choice, it's been the statistic of choice in many jurisdictions for quite some time. Within the United Kingdom, in Europe, in Australia, and New Zealand, likelihood ratios is pretty much the standard way that DNA test results are presented, and that's been the case for the past 15 years at least, if not more like 20 or 25. But that's in contrast to the practice within the United States. Within the United States, aside from their use in paternity testing uh, instances, uh, likelihood ratios have generally not been very widely used within the criminal justice system for a variety of reasons. But let's roll up our sleeves a little bit and talk exactly about what's going on with these likelihood ratio approaches. So again, we're simply comparing the, the relative support that an evidence sample gives to two competing hypotheses. One of those hypotheses is the prosecution's hypothesis, the other is the defense's hypothesis. And what we're asking in English here is the probability that an evidence sample would look the way that it does if the prosecution's hypothesis was actually correct. And the other hypothesis is what's the probability that an evidence sample would look the way that it does if the defense's hypothesis was correct. Let's put this in a couple other, uh, let, let me use a couple other images to talk about how it is that we could talk about the relative weight of these two. Here we've got a blue box that looks sort of like a, a weight that might be placed on a scale. That's one of the, the weights that we're gonna get from the evaluation of an evidence sample. Here we've got a green box that gives a, another weight. This is the weight for the defense's hypothesis. And in simple English, the blue box, again, is simply the weight that we would attach if the evidence sample was consistent with the prosecution's theory of the case. And the green box is the weight that we would attach if the evidence sample is consistent with the defense's theory of the case. Let me draw your attention here to the fact that the prosecution's theory can be spelled out in very specific terms. And the defense's theory can be spelled out in very specific terms. There's very little ambiguity when we're looking at these kinds of descriptions of the prosecution's theory and the defense's theory, and they're very obviously different. If the weight that we attach to the prosecution's theory of the case is very much larger, much greater than the weight that we attach to the defense's theory of the case, the likelihood ratio will give us a value that's much greater than one. And many laboratories now are moving toward these subjective uh, interpretations of test results where they'll say that after you've crossed a certain threshold, we can start talking about very strong or even very compelling support for the prosecution's explanation for the evidence sample. The point here though being that when the scale tilts in one direction, here, when it tilts to the prosecution's side, we're seeing that some assessment has been made that makes us think that the prosecution's explanation of the evidence sample looks more likely, looks like it's a better fit than what we had seen, what we would expect to see if the defense's theory was correct. If what we find is that there's an equal amount of weight that's given to the prosecution's theory of the case, as to the defense's theory of the case, those values are equal in this particular example. This number divided by this number, since they're the same, equals one. For a test that we get equal support for both the prosecution's and the defense's theory of the case, and the likelihood ratio is one, we can draw this conclusion. We simply say these test results are inconclusive. There's a subtle point about the weights that are given to the values that factor into these likelihood ratios. In one probabilistic genotyping case in which I was involved, the barrister involved in the case posed an interesting question to the judge uh, when he asked that the DNA test results be considered inadmissible in this particular case. He asked very simply, my lord, consider this question as an alternative to the ones that we've been talking about. Simply, who has stolen my biscuit? And let's consider 
what I'm considering. Let's consider what I'm evaluating when I'm asking who has stolen my biscuit. On one hand, I'm entertaining the possibility that it's Father Christmas that stole my biscuit. And I accept that there's a very small amount of weight that we should attach to that particular proposition because by all accounts, Father Christmas is a man of upstanding character, uh, does, he's widely loved by people around the world. Why would he steal a biscuit? But the only alternative explanation I'm considering, if you will, my defense hypothesis for Father Christmas, is that a unicorn has stolen my biscuit. And everybody knows that unicorns are mythical creatures. Uh, they don't exist. They're, there's very little chance that a unicorn is responsible for my biscuit having gone missing. And so when I'm faced with these two competing hypotheses, I'm simply left with the with the, I simply must accept that it is much more likely that Father Christmas is the individual who has taken my cookie. And then after a pause, he says, unless, of course, I start to consider alternative hypotheses to the unicorn hypothesis, for instance, that maybe it was my brother that has stolen my biscuit. And one of the things that we need to bear in mind when we're talking about these likelihood ratio approaches is that very often both the prosecution's theory and the defense's theory are not well supported by what is seen in the actual test results. It's quite common for a probabilistic genotyping approach to attach infinitesimally small possibilities or probabilities that the prosecution's theory would give rise to the type of evidence sample that you're seeing. And yet, because the prosecution's theory, as improbable as it may be, is more probable than what you would get if the defense's theory was correct, we get a likelihood ratio that might make it appear as if there's compelling evidence in support of the prosecution's theory of the case. And so again, this is something that needs to be borne in mind pretty much for all likelihood ratio approaches. It's worth asking just how well does the evidence sample support the prosecution's theory of the case. Very often, it turns out that it doesn't. It's just that it's a, the prosecution's theory is better supported than a particular defense theory of the case. So for some DNA samples, this isn't a problem. Some DNA test results can be interpreted with great confidence. And as we've seen from other videos in this series, uh, they're very easy to take a look. So some DNA profiles can be interpreted very confidently. As we've seen with other videos in this series, they're pretty cut and dry, they're black and white, there's not much ambiguity in terms of what alleles are present and what alleles are absent. And so it's worth pausing to ask just what sort of features of a DNA profile make us confident in our interpretation of those test results. And I've listed for you on this slide a number of features that you might point to and say, ah, look, the, the heights of these peaks are all tall. That makes me feel like I've gotten a good look at the DNA evidence in this sample. Their shapes are all pretty much what I would expect a peak's shape to be. Uh, I never see more than two alleles at any of the loci that have been tested. That makes me think this may well be a single source sample. The heights of the peaks where I see two are very similar to each other. They're in peak height balance. That makes me confident in the results. Uh, the peaks are pretty much the same height from the beginning to the end. That also could be used to bolster my confidence. I don't see anything in the way of baseline noise. Where I see stutter peaks, for instance, this small peak at the 11 position before the 12, that stutter peak might actually be something I point to as something that's making me confident the 12 is there. You don't see small peaks like this anywhere else on this electropherogram except at a stutter position. That stutter position, again, is a very commonly encountered technical artifact. The fact that stutter is there can make me feel even more confident that the 12 allele is present. And there are other things that you might consider when you're deciding how confident you are in what we're seeing for a particular set of electropherograms. Uh, for instance, common alleles, if the 28 and the 29 alleles are the ones that are most common in a particular population, observing them might bolster my confidence in a test result. And I'll leave it up to you to come up with other features that you might consider 
that would make you more confident. This is just a, an enumeration of several things that might make you think, ah, I know what's happening with this DNA profile. And what I'd like you to do as we make the transition from this slide to the next slide is remember those sorts of features that you looked at that made you feel good about how you would interpret this particular set of electropharograms. And now as we go back to that sample that uh, started this video, uh, what do you see when we're looking for those types of features? The heights of the peaks here are very low. That reduces my confidence in the test results. I see a lot of baseline noise. In fact, I often see things at the baseline that are starting to approach the height of the things that look like they're peaks. This peak here doesn't seem to have the quite quite the right shape, does it? It's asymmetrical, it's sort of sort and squat. Maybe that's a warning sign. Maybe I shouldn't be confident that that comes from DNA associated with the original sample. By the same token, there are peaks like this one here. This is in a 15 position. Relative to that 16, that might be a stutter peak that's going to improve my confidence in that 16. So looking at these samples, there are a lot of features that you might tap into that would cause you to enter into sort of a gray area. Does the observation of what might be a stutter peak make you certain that that's a 16? Well, by itself, probably not, but it certainly increases our confidence that the 16 is real. Does having that asymmetry of this peak make you certain that it's not a peak, that it's not associated with DNA? Well, maybe not, but it makes us a little bit suspicious. Likelihood ratio approaches can take that uncertainty into account and, and help us factor in that we're 80% confident or 90% confident that a particular peak is real as opposed to an artifact. And there are a number of individuals who have been endeavoring to capture that type of information and incorporate it into, in some instances, very complicated software models that ultimately deliver likelihood ratios for probabilistic genotyping types of samples. The simplest of those models are the ones that are shown here with a green background. They're simple in the sense that they are actually just semi-continuous models. They aren't taking into account peak height information. They're simply taking into account whether or not an analyst felt an allele was present or not present in a particular sample. There are a number of such programs. This is not necessarily a complete list, but these are among the most commonly used semi-continuous probabilistic genotyping approaches. And since there are semi-continuous approaches, it shouldn't surprise you to hear that there are also continuous models. And you might imagine that when you do start to take peak height information into account, that the complexity of the programs increases. And that's essentially what we see happening as we go further down this particular slide. Uh, star mix and true allele in particular are very complicated algorithms that involve tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of computer code that allow them to generate likelihood ratios that take into account the fact that there could be an unknown number of contributors, that take into account the fact that drop in and drop out of alleles may have been occurring, and also potentially to capture nuances, things like peak height ratios, differences in peak shapes, and the the, the comfort that we get from observing a stutter peak, for instance, associated with another peak, again, suggesting to us that maybe there really is an allele present in that other position. These more sophisticated and complicated <coughs> algorithms that are used by StarMix and True Allele, for instance, take advantage of a statistical approach known as Monte Karloff Markov chain. Uh, and intrinsic to MCMC approaches is a random number seed such that you should never actually expect to get the same result when you use these approaches on the same evidence sample. At first pass, this might seem counterintuitive that expect uh, from a scientific approach that if you feed in the same data, you'll get the same conclusion every time. Again, 
for approaches like star mix and true allele that are based on an MC MC approach, that's not necessarily the case. If you run the same data two times in a row, you're often will find, you'll typically find that you get different results. Here, uh, the first run of this particular evidence sample attached a likelihood ratio of 215 trillion. Uh, and, and I, that works out to 250 t 215 times, <clears throat> that works out to 215 trillion times better support for the prosecution's theory of the case than the defense's theory of the case. And yet when it was run just a few seconds later, the same program with the same data came back with a different amount of support. Here the likelihood ratio was only 204 trillion times better support for the prosecution's theory of the case than the defense's theory of the case. So where do things stand? From the previous few slides, you can see that there are a number of probabilistic genotyping approaches that are now current, that are now commercially available. These are all intended to wrestle with the most challenging samples for human analysts. And in fact, in my experience, they, they are used only when human experts look at test results and say, gee, our standard operating procedures, our interpretation guidelines do not apply in these circumstances because they're very marginal. There's an unknown number of contributors. Allelic dropout may have occurred. And so probabilistic genotyping tends to be used in the most difficult and most challenging of DNA test results. And that use has been getting a fair bit of attention. This is an increasingly common problem given the nature of the samples that crime laboratories are testing. And defense attorneys, at the very least, have been challenging the reliability of these probabilistic approaches. Because of this controversy, because of the, this emerging, the emerging nature of this field, the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, PCAST, issued a report to the President in September of 2016 that summarized the state of the art at that point in time. Um, the first main observation about probabilistic genotyping is that Complicated mixtures are complicated and they're very difficult to interpret. And as we've been saying all along, not just in this video, but other videos in this series, that it's often difficult not only to determine the number of contributors to a sample, it's extremely difficult to determine the actual DNA profiles of the individuals who have contributed to the sample. But this point here is a particularly important one. I'll read it verbatim. It says that objective analysis of, com of complex DNA mixtures with probabilistic genotyping software is a relatively new and promising approach. And I think this is something that pretty much everyone at this point in time can agree to. But take note of the fact that it's relatively new and it's promising. It doesn't necessarily say that it has realized its promise. And a little further in that PCAST report, it talks a little bit about how much of that promise has been realized. And the bottom line is essentially this. The PCAST report gives some pretty specific thresholds for samples where they say effectively that if a sample meets these criteria, we can count on probabilistic genotyping to give us reliable results reliable results based on foundational validation studies. Here's the thing though, those thresholds for which we can start to say that probabilistic genotyping approaches are giving us reliable results, those thresholds when applied would be the same types of samples for which random match probabilities or combined probability of inclusion approaches would also be likely to give us results. These are samples with a relatively small and ostensibly a known number of contributors. And these are samples where each of the contributors has contributed enough DNA such that we can be confident that allelic dropout hasn't occurred. That is when we use the random match probability, if we can discern between the major and the minor contributors, we can use a random match probability for the major contributor. And that is when we use a combined probability of inclusion approach when we can't discern between the major and minor, but we know that dropout hasn't occurred. 
And so where we, where we seem to be at this point in time with respect to the technical validation of probabilistic genotyping approaches is that when we can be confident in test results using approaches like the random match probability and the combined probability of inclusion, it looks like probabilistic genotyping approaches can also be relied upon to give us the same results. But remember, when probabilistic genotyping approaches get used is not in those circumstances. Instead, in my experience, they're used consistently for the most challenging of samples, the ones where we don't know the number of contributors and the ones where allelic dropout and drop in are very, very likely to have occurred. So there's a, a gap between what it is that's been established as reliable and what it is that probabilistic genotyping approaches would like to be able to do. And the challenge now is improve those probabilistic genotyping approaches to close that gap. I suppose the only alternative to that solution is to simply avoid testing marginal samples in the first place. One last thought. The probabilistic genotyping approaches that are the most complicated, the most sophisticated models, programs like StarMix and TrueAllele, both operate effectively as black boxes. A black box is a device that gives you a solution without ever really telling you how it is that it arrives at that value. The manufacturers, the distributors of StarMix and TrueAllele are both very resistant to providing defense experts access to the source code that underlies their complicated computer programs. In some sense, these models could be described as being oracular in the spirit of the temple at Delphi. Uh, a question would be posed to the, to the temple at Delphi and an answer would be obtained, but no explanation as to how it is that that answer was derived, was given. And in fact, you couldn't even ask the oracle yourself the question, you had to do it through an intermediary, a priest. With star mix and true alleles and some of the more sophisticated uh, some of the other more sophisticated probabilistic genotyping models, that's a pretty fair assessment of what's going on given that defense experts haven't had the opportunity to look under the hood and really see if the software is doing what it is intended to do and what parameters it's using and if those parameters are consistent with what human experts have come to understand over the course of years of evaluating DNA test results. And what we're seeing emerge now is a conflict between the proponents of StarMix and TrueAllele and other sophisticated probabilistic genotyping software packages who are saying that their intellectual property rights takes precedence over a defendant's right to confront a witness against him. Uh, and this is still being played out in the courts in a number of instances where challenges have been made and, and requests have been made for access to the source code to these complicated probabilistic genotyping programs. Courts have sided on the side of the software manufacturers and distributors, but there are other cases that are being evaluated where that's still an open issue. And so again, this is an emerging area. Uh, as the PCAST report tells us, this is a relatively new approach, and it's one where certain things still need to be sorted out. Well, that's pretty much all that I had meant to talk with you about in the course of this video with respect to probabilistic genotyping. Once again, if you would like to get a copy of the slides that are associated with this video, you can find them as well as other supporting materials at bioforensics.com. And if you're interested in learning more about other aspects of forensic DNA profiling, you'll also be able to find related videos that talk about things such as the random match probability, combined probability of inclusion approaches, and technical artifacts in DNA profiling. Thanks for your attention.